you for having me. Um, so the last time I was in this room was on a church date because um, I was looking for a church. I was looking for a girlfriend. I figured I'd combine the two together. Um, and I'm hoping that this speech goes better than, than my dates. So <laughs> wish me luck. Um, so I'm going to find the clicker somewhere. Thank you. We're off to a, a better start than my dates. Um, so I, I want to talk about how we prepare kids for the jobs of the future. Um, if you take teenage kids, uh, it's 13% of the population, but then it goes on to become 100% of the future. Um, and the question is, how do we prepare them for the jobs that will be in the future? And that involves things like coding, that involves design, that involves design thinking and project management. And you know, th there was a, a great video right before this of kids debating with each other. It involves debate, it involves collaboration. How do you prepare kids for those types of skills is the question that I want to get to today. Um, our journey started in places like this, in um, Guatemala and in Brazil and in Indonesia, where uh, for about 10 years we've been building technology to, uh, to teach kids around the world. And it's really focused on device access and internet access and reaching remote communities. Um, in this country, 30% <clears throat> um, <clears throat> of the math teachers are able to pass the math exam that they're teaching to. So let me rephrase that, 70% of the math teachers fail the math te exam that they're teaching to. So how do you prepare a, an entire generation for the skills that they, their own teachers don't have? Um, that same question actually applies um, in this country where the majority of schools and the majority of teachers don't know how to code or don't know what design looks like or how to use Photoshop or how you know, software gets built. So how are you going to teach that next generation to, to do those things? So I believe the answer lies in, in that number up there, 20 hours, which is 20 hours a week that the average kid is playing video games. So if you tally that up, by the time they graduate from school, that's 10,000 hours. I don't know if any of you have read Malcolm Gladwell's book, but 10,000 hours is enough to be a virtuoso at just about anything. So if we can take a sliver of those 10,000 hours where they're virtuosos in playing video games, the average kid, how do you use a piece of that to teach kids the skills that uh, will be part of their futures? Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk about games and actually why they're so well suited to teach. And you can read through this, and this is kind of the, the summary of, you know, education historically has a lot of challenges to it. It's boring, it's passive, it's static, it's linear, lots of different things in there. And if you take games, they're kind of the inverse on most of those. But at the end of the day, a game is basically a giant learning engine. You start tutorializing, and then you get a little bit better at that challenge, and then you get better until you're playing the big boss and you're getting even better. And that can be a platformer where you're jumping around, that can be a shooting game where you're shooting, that can be a puzzle game where you're solving puzzles, or that can be any type of game where you're trying to get better at the thing you're trying to do. And in our case, we believe that you can apply that same logic to a lot of things. Games are also interactive, they're dynamic, they're narrative-based, so they have you know, story and stakes. There are many of them 3D and they're immersive. They're also safe places to fail. A big reason that kids struggle to learn is because they're afraid of failure. And yet, a game is all about failing. It's all about not hitting the level and not hitting the level and not hitting the level until you do. So <clears throat> in so many ways, it's funny, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking to this audience. So many of you are here for that reason is because you believe in this thesis. So in some sense, this slide is for everybody on YouTube who is not here because this isn't a commonly held belief outside of these rooms. Um, <clears throat> so despite this, and despite the 10,000 hours, there's sort of an interesting um, pairing of facts and something that doesn't line up for me. So the two pairings of facts. So first, gaming, if you take um, all of the music industry and all of the movie industry, so that's you know, all of Taylor Swift and you know, all of you know, Top Gun, Maverick, you take all of that and you combine that and you double it, gaming as an industry is larger than that. So gaming is like one of the, if you take tidal waves in humanity, like it's one of the biggest tidal waves that's happened. 
And then if you take ed tech, it's a $250 billion industry. It's massive. If you look at just venture capital going into it, those are the numbers. It's huge. So education, gaming, they're both kids. We just saw the slide making the case for why it is that those two things should go together. And yet if you look at what's happening at the intersection, it's like a ripple. So gaming today in education um, it looks a lot more <laughs> like this um, than it does like Fortnite, which is what, oh, which is what kid, uh, um, gaming today, you know, to do, do a quick kind of historic retrospective and then zoom forward in time for a second. If you look back, it used to be that games were, were things like Oregon Trail and where in the world is Carmen San Diego and Civilization and Sim City and all of these games that were actually like really good at teaching. They were basically education games. But they were also some of back then the most successful games, you know, to, even to this day in history. But somewhere along the way, consumer games took off and education games kind of stayed where they were. If you go and Google, at some point I suggest, go, go Google best 15 best learning games. And literally someone in the audience who works with us um, ran one of the games on that. And it shows up, the first on the list, the Zumbinis. It's a 20-year-old game, and it's still on the 2001 list of the top 15 learning games. So <clears throat> there needs to be, we believe, progress. And there can be progress. So, a couple of the reasons that we get uh, when we ask people why aren't there more learning games? Why, why, why haven't those two curves climbed in, ta in tandem? One is AAA games cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build. It's true. Um, chocolate and broccoli. Kids, when they're playing games, they want to have fun. When they're learning, they, they don't want to learn. Um, and these are things that people from you know, the biggest game companies are telling me, the people who are allocating the capital, people who are making the decisions are saying, chocolate, broccoli, you just don't mix them. Um, discretionary time. Kids have so many choices in where to spend their time. Why are they going to play a learning game when they can be playing you know, Fortnite or Call of Duty? Um, curriculum coverage. If you're building for schools, you've got to cover everything. You've got to, you know, all grades, all subjects, all topics. That's a lot. How are you going to do that? So I will get to these um, in a few minutes, but I actually think there's um, a deeper underlying issue, which is there's sort of a, a, a pair of philosophical decisions or assumptions that get made as people are deciding not to make really, really great consumer-centric games um, for those 10,000 hours. And those two decisions are they it basically come from the same source, which is a belief that you can't win discretionary teenage time. So if you can't win discretionary teenage time, who do you go after? You go after two groups. One is parents who decide what their kids play, and that's young kids, because that still happens at that age. So you end up with a lot of actually good games targeting very young kids. Uh, <clears throat> option one. Option two is people who are targeting the classroom and schools where teachers can decide what their students are going to play. The challenge there is, again, if you speak to the people who design for those worlds, of which our team has many of them, uh, the, the challenge there is like you literally you hear stories of the, t the schools going and being like, you know all those fun things that the kids are actually enjoying, the things like collecting the coins and the badges and all those things? Well, those take up time we don't have in the classroom. Can you take those out? Because they have a learning objective. They have, you know, they have tests and schools and standardized tests to get to. So, it's, there's a challenge of teaching. Um, th th those two spaces, I want to be clear, are huge opportunities. There should be more happening there. My contention is that there's not more happening for teenagers in discretionary time. And I believe that there can be and I believe that there should be. Because the result of all of those, those two assumptions is games that look like school for kids. And that wasn't the promise of the 10,000 hours. That wasn't the promise of the reason that these kids are spending so many hours in front of the games that they are obsessed with and in love with. So this is the game. These types of games are the ones the kids are playing with and obsessed with. Why aren't there learning games that feel more like these games? And I, I contest the core premise that discretionary time 
for teenagers can't be taken up by kids wanting to learn something. And I contested on two bases. One is in principle, and the second is in practice. In principle, kids are social. Games are social. Kids are curious. They want to learn. It's just that they want to learn about the things they want to learn about, not the things necessarily that school wants to teach them about. In discretionary time, when I'm done with my homework, I'm done with my homework. I want to do the things I care about. But if you go and you look at apps like Duolingo has had 500 million downloads, 40 million active users every month, a bunch of those who are teens and young adults wanting to learn a language, kids wanting to learn investing in crypto, whatever passion they may have, kids are looking ahead at their life and saying, what do I want to do with my life? Do I want to be a designer? Do I want to be an engineer? Do I want to be a, you know, I, I went into, to, in my case, I went into real estate for quite a while, in part because I played Civilization, or I played SimCity, I used to love it, and the result was me being interested in urban planning, and the result was a career. So, um, the interesting, um, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second, and then the final is the kids are creative, and you see that in things like Minecraft. People love, humans love building. You see it, my child is two years old and he is obsessed with building sandcastles at the level he can. He is obsessed with building Legos. Like these are human instincts to create, to paint, to write poems, to make. And the reason that you see the success of something like a Minecraft is because it's basically that same instinct that Legos and sandcastles were now. But what happens after that? What happens after Minecraft? What happens when people want something more sophisticated? So I, I, in principle, believe it. But in practice, these are some of the most successful consumer games in history. And if you look at the list of games that teach and are effective at teaching, this is an, you know, just a beginning, scratching the surface. There are a ton of amazing consumer games that have been wildly commercially successful that, that teach. And so, I believe that there needs to be a little bit uh, that's more deliberate around that. Um, <clears throat> um, brief comment, I'm just going to say, because uh, a call out to, to Plague Inc. Um, prior to, to Plague Inc., I, I spoke at, um, at, at the last Games for Change conference many years ago before COVID. Um, I think this was the year right before COVID. And the person who had built that was, was, was next to me. I felt like I was meeting like a celebrity before that. Uh, that game is basically like when COVID hit, I knew all about viral dynamics. I knew all, it looked like I was watching the game on like CNN around me because and like I knew what was coming. I wrote a blog post when there were 100,000 cases talking about the power of exponentiality because you go and you see it and you experience it. And so that I call out as one game, the others most of people have heard of, that is one example of a learning game that was not meant to be a learning game, it just happened to be the top 10 in the App Store. So <clears throat> when we were in these rural communities, um, we, we discovered that uh, games could teach. And so we had, that was kind of a aha insight number one. Aha insight, um, oh, and yes, I didn't give you the aha insight. A high insight number one was we would walk into these rural schools and we would see kids. We'd put, we'd bundled up these really terrible Linux games, to be honest. It's kind of what we had. We'd put it into it. Um, and we would walk into these schools in these rural communities and there would be 20 kids surrounding a classroom shouting numbers at each other because a, a game that was basically a multiplication table wrapped in a game. And so that was the moment where we realized games can teach in communities where teachers can't teach. And the moment that I realized that 21st century skills, things like coding, could also be taught in the same way was every time I would interview one of our engineers, someone who was a prospective engineer, I would ask them a question. I was just curious. How did you learn to code? What was your journey to it? And I was curious because I never learned to code. I wish I had, and I wanted to know. And the answer started to just like repeat itself over and over again. And it was, as a kid, I loved playing video games. They would almost be embarrassed, you know? It's kind of embarrassing, but I love playing video games. And then one day I discovered I could hack my games. That was the most common way of people learning to code. And so what we did was we started, we partnered with Eline Media, an amazing organization that built Minecraft EDU, GameStar Mechanic, a bunch of other games that merge sort of learning and games. Uh, the real craft of games, and we built 
a world in which the idea is that there are all of these different portals with all of these different games inside of them and they're all hackable and they take you on these hacking quests and then there's a UGC capability behind the scenes where you can then build games yourself. Sort of a higher budget targeting a AAA type approach. At the same time what we did <clears throat> was we tackled the other end of the spectrum and I started a little lab and we hired uh, different studios around emerging markets and the goal was basically just to explore. The money's all gonna be thrown away, we're not gonna make money off of this, but we're gonna learn from it. And so we built piles of games and here's a, a slide, I was going through old decks and found this slide um, th that was an update to, to our board actually. So this is literally a, a, a live slide. And um, this was somewhere along the development cycle, but. We, for $586,000, spent um, on 22 games and experiences. Um, we were building games, you know, I'm not great games, but we were building games for $20,000, $50,000. Now, those were little experiments, little nuggets to kind of try things, but the quality, the reality is, if you increase the budget more than that, you don't need hundreds of millions of dollars. The fact that you have development engines like Unity and Unreal, you have asset stores where you can take asset packs of entire worlds and all the expense of the art will cost you $50, $100 to put into it. And you have talent around the world that you could harness. We had 1.7 people running eight game teams around the world all concurrently. The fact that you have this sort of talent means that there are ways of building games more affordably. You don't need $100 million. If you have a $1 million, you can build a good game. Um, and then the last piece on it was we were just trying to test game mechanics. We were like, what, you know, how would you teach you know, this concept with this genre? It was almost kind of like spin the roulette table, you know, roulette things and see, see what comes up uh, and, and then try different, try, try different games. And the answer was everywhere we looked, there was so much potential to teach. There were so many ways of using games to teach. I mean, it was like, you know, in each case, I, I wish we had more budget to plow into each one of them because there were so many concepts that were rife. And as a little bit of a testament to what even a small budget with that philosophy and that development methodology could, could do, we decided to put these games on games for, uh, uh, on Hour of Code the, we were, there were new games that year, obviously, because we had just put them. Within two days, they were the top most played games. So it is possible to do it, both at the big and the small. Um, <clears throat> and so I want to go through a, a, a few of the items that I mentioned before, which is starting with development costs. It doesn't take $100 million to build these games. The tools and capabilities that are there now are the reason that there is the indie game revolution. And when you look at the people who are putting the big money, $100 million in there, they're not gonna be the ones to do this. Most likely you speak to them and they don't have an interest in it, at least the ones that I speak to, because the proof isn't there. They know that if they put that $100 million in, they're probably not gonna get a return on it because they haven't, there, there is not prior art of getting that. But the indie game community, the indie game community can be the ones that are disrupting, that are creating that catalyst. Um, <clears throat> developers and teachers, just a quick comment on this, because some people are like, yes, obviously, 100%. Other people, it's kind of, a, you, know, you know, not implicit, but so many of the education games that are built are built by educators with the purpose of educating. But you need developers who know the core game loop, that know how to make things fun, because making things fun is a craft. It's an art, not a science. It's, it, you know, there, there, there's a process to find the fun. And that has to be there if you're gonna get a kid's discretionary time. If you're not a teacher or a parent telling your kid what to do, if you're gonna get the discretionary time, you need the, you need the fun and that is game design. Um, as we talk about gaps in the industry, there isn't a good distribution platform for learning games. At least this is what we found. So when we went to take those little games and we started then testing distribution platforms, we found you put it on the App Store, it is hard to win the App Store, especially as a small little learning game. Uh, Steam, it, it, you're competing directly head to head with the entertainment world. Again, it, 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 it's, um, it's easy to get lost in that world. We did, like what there needs to be, we believe, is a master class or a Udemy or a Udacity or a Coursera of learning games. Um, the other last two points are related, which is sandbox games are, are just so powerful because there's so much that you can do with them. And 
sandbox games then create user-generated content, and that user-generated content has the ability to be the thing that actually teaches. So um, I'll for fast forward just briefly to talk about what we're doing now, converging those two products into a more holistic experience, which is that we realized that there are two halves to this. There is making to learn and playing to learn. Mostly when we thought about games, we thought about playing to learn. You play a game and you learn through playing. But actually, there's something so powerful in making to learn because when you make, when you make, you, um, I'm realizing over time, so I'm gonna sum this up very quickly, but when you make, you're basically using all of the skills of creation. And when you make in community, you're using the collaboration of partnership of what it, what it looks like to actually build things. And if you wrap that together with a service and a community where you have guides and mentors and you create a holistic nurturing experience for you to use games to learn, we believe that it's possible uh, to use games to teach. Um, the last comment I'm gonna make is just, uh, when the founder of Dropbox started Dropbox, he had forgotten his USB key and he was on a Chinatown bus and he sat there with hours to think and he was sitting there thinking, in Minority Report, they never had USB key keys, I mean, was Tom Cruise carrying around a USB key? What would Tom Cruise have had? And his answer was, you know, was Dropbox, and that became the cloud. And if you ask yourself, well, in the year 2050 in Minority Report, what technology were those kids using? Why can't we build that today? And that's my call to action.